to rearrange my talk uh, to build upon the ideas that Ingo was presenting uh, and to re reinforce some areas and point out areas where there's at least disagreement in the field as to what's going on. These are thoughts uh, that I was typing to myself during yesterday and since we have this afternoon for a discussion, I thought I would just go ahead and start. What was I thinking in, in the back of the room, being an electron scattering person and not a neutrino scattering person? And one of the first thing I was thinking was, if I had to do E prime P on a heavy nucleus, not knowing my beam energy, and you said extract the free nucleon form factors, <laughs> that's an extremely challenging problem, even just to think about how I would go about doing it. So even for electron scattering, that would not be an easy uh, problem to task us with. And that's something we could do, just playing with data, take samples from different beam energies, throw it all together, and have fun. Electron scattering physicists have become very good at enhancing or suppressing effects. Admittedly, this is with guidance from our theoretical friends. Uh, we certainly know the kinematics uh, to go to to maximize final state reactions or maximize mesonic exchange currents or try to minimize them. Those are, of course, model dependent statements. But when you see s slices of electron scattering cross-section data, you need to look very carefully at the kinematics. In general, people are using high resolution spectrometers and very carefully uh, selected uh, their kinematics to enhance one thing or another, to try to suppress. And that was basically forced upon us years ago. So you, at some level, neutrino scattering has gotten to where electron scattering was 30, 40 years ago. Life isn't as simple as you like it. The nucleon is not just a collection of protons and neutrons in a mean field. Uh, a comment. The, the kinematics where people have observed in electron scattering or even proton scattering, that I'll show you, are rather extreme kinematics. It was not easily seen <coughs> at all when you talk about 500 MeV over C recoiling nucleons. Uh, it was interesting to note that a lot of the neutrino energies where the cross sections are large are, are close to Jefferson lab energies. That was encouraging. At high energy, continuum dominates over bound states. So if you're a classic nuclear physicist and you're worried about carbon-12 excitations, vibrational, that's not where most of the cross-section is uh, when we talk about energies around a GeV. It's the continuum. And Ingo did a nice job showing you a spectral function where you had that emis or energy and momentum ridge going up. One thing that puzzled me yesterday, and I'm still not sure I've gotten my head wrapped around. So final state interactions are, at least within a particular basis, constrained very much by the data. There's certainly a wealth of electron scattering data. So if you take a particular spectral function with a particular prescription of final state interactions where everything has been done consistently, and consistency is very important, it should match the cross section. You don't tweak the final state interaction. We're actually getting it uh, from particular theorists. Uh, yesterday, you were shown calculations from Omar. Another thing to point out, there is the Jefferson lab at 6GV didn't spend a lot of time focused on doing uh, spectral functions or E'P reactions with the class detector. This is a 4 pi detector. Every time they ran a heavy target, we took amazing amounts of EE prime, E prime P, E prime PP, PN. So there is a wealth of data on tape, and we were very fortunate. Uh, the Tel Aviv group, in particular, has gone to that data and is mining it for all it's worth. So there shall be a lot more data coming from the 6GV program uh, from Jefferson Lab than uh, you've yet seen. And Another comment, because it's almost a similar puzzle uh, to what neutrino scattering people are worrying about. We worry in electron scattering about the neutron. We'd like to know the, electric or the <coughs> magnetic electric form factor of a neutron. Or if you're into deep and elastic scattering, I'd like to know U over D ratios. 
we don't have a free neutron target either. <coughs> so whether I'm using deuterium or helium-3, we don't just treat those as, I don't treat even deuteron as being a free proton or neutron. If I really want to do high precision work and extract correctly the information neutron, rely heavily on theory and help from our friends in theory. Just a reminder, so those were my thoughts from yesterday. Uh, get you thinking. A reminder of electron scattering kinematics. We know our beam energy very precisely. Usually at the Edison lab, it's around 10 to the minus 4. Uncertainty in energy to the absolute energy. Measure the scattered energy. That defines our Q squared, or omega and Q. And in some of the experiments I'll discuss today, that's all we measure, just measure the scattered electron. Also do experiments where we detect an outgoing nucleon like a proton, leaving the rest of the system undetected, or even experiments where we detect multiple particles in the E prime PP reaction. So I use omega instead of nu for energy transfer, but that's simply beam energy minus the detected energy. Four momentum transferred, and so the three momentum squared minus omega. Missing momentum is just the momentum of whatever I didn't detect that's quite relevant for the E prime P reaction. And finally, I use Burkane X in a way that deep and elastic scattering physicists probably think is sacrilege. To me, it's just kinematics. And I just plot it. I measure all the quantities on the right side of that formula. I measure Q squared, I know the mass, and I measure omega. So I can plot my data in terms of Burkane X. It, I use the nucleon mass. You're all right, there's a few percent correction whether I, I put in a free nucleon mass or take into account binding. So that's 1%. I'm not going to worry about that today. Uh, it is worth pointing out there are other very beautiful uh, ways of applying data, like using a Y scaling variable. I just like this one. It's very easy and natural to start with, and everything after that's transformation. Electron scattering regions. So we mentioned yesterday scattering at x greater than 1. What the heck is x greater than 1? If I take elastic scattering data on a free proton, that ideal target, I'd have a nice elastic scattering peak at exactly q squared over 2m, where for a proton, that would be little m, and I would come out at a burkane x of exactly 1. Then Resonance region, delta production, deep and elastic as I go higher and higher in omega for a fixed Q squared. But as soon as I put in a nuclear target, the region up to Q squared 2MA, where that's the mass of the target, opens up. So it's just simply where's elastic scattering for deuterium or argon or lead? This, this region is now kinematically accessible. If you're doing low energy experiments, you'll see elastic scattering peak, and then those great nuclear resonances and inelastic states, or carbon 12, E prime P, vibration excitational modes. As we turn the beam energy up even more, that gets suppressed, and this becomes a smooth region with no apparent structure. So if I go all the way back to the 70s for electron scattering data, I already knew that mean field, this is almost before I was born, mean field can't be the entire story. Shown here are charge distributions, so the function of the radius of the nucleus, compared to mean field theory. And immediately you'll see the experimental extracted results, which are done by doing elastic scattering on that nucleus over a very large region of Q squared, uh, doesn't agree with any kind of simple theory. The result I always thought was just classic and often repeated. Let's take a nucleus A, do E prime P. So I'm going to come in with my electron, knock a proton out. I'm going to leave the system in a bound state. So carbon 12, for example, going boron 11. If you do a calculation, in a simple independent particle shell model, where the particles are uh, nucleons moving in an average potential, and I compare that calculation to experiment, 
there's a rather big discrepancy between the cross section. That was striking, or can be striking, because the shape is very good. So if I look at the shape of the cross section, the functional form at low missing momentum, mean field theory does a great job. Independent particle shell model does a great job. But I won't get the absolute strength correct. There's something missing. And one of the logical next steps would be to add, if I'm starting off in a mean field picture, add some kind of correlations at high momentum. If I take a toy, completely toy model of a momentum distribution, so this little dashed line is just a falling exponential, I normalize it so that the integral of this function times the momentum squared, d momentum, is normalized to 1, or just a constant, sorry. I then take a second function made up of two exponentials, and I normalize it the exact same way. The effect of adding a high momentum component is to reduce the cross section at low missing momentum, it reduces the strength. That's just say taking a toy model of one exponential, normalizing it, make, take a second model with two exponentials, normalize it in the same way, and you will rob, apparently, the strength at low missing momentum. That's a toy. That's something I can do. It's far more realistic. Uh, this is work of Omar Benar, carbon 12. You start off with an independent particle model. Here, again, this is missing momentum and inverse Fermi in a momentum distribution. By adding the correlations into the picture, you're changing the strength at low missing momentum, which looks to an experimentalist as if the cross section is much lower than you get from the simple calculation. So a very nice, elegant explanation of why you saw the missing strength in the E' P reaction with the bound state. That's not the entire story. There's certainly many other ingredients and effects going on. But it's part of the picture, and it's an important ingredient uh, if you expect to get uh, proper cross-section out. Now, yesterday, it, we were told, and it's certainly true, I can't measure directly uh, the effects of high missing momentum. It's not an observable, per se. So it's always fun to see if, if there is an experiment you can do where you see, at least as well as you can see as an experimentalist, uh, what's going on. And my favorite is vector polarized deuterium. That's because it's an easy system to understand. If I just think of deuteron, I know most of it's going to be S state. So I think of, okay, I got proton and neutron, spin one particle, they've got to be pointing the same way with zero angular momentum. Most of the rest of the story be described by a D state. And then have L equals 2. I still need to have a spin 1 particle. So I point the proton and neutron in the opposite direction. So between the S state and D state in this very cartoony picture, the proton spin has flipped. This is cute. But can I do anything with that nice simple picture? And what I can do is measure the asymmetry from vector polarized deuterium E prime P. So I vector polarize the deuteron, and I'm going to measure the E prime P reaction with polarized electron beam, and just measure as a function of missing momentum. What do you observe? If I go to low missing momentum, so this is when the neutron has very little momentum, so practically just sitting still. In the nucleus, the calculation will very nicely agree with S only. Another way of saying that is it very nicely would agree, at least to the precision of this plot, with a free proton sitting there. But as I dial experimentally missing momentum, and I'm getting well past the Fermi momentum of the nucleons in a deuteron, the observable, the asymmetry, starts to change sign. So exactly as a hand wavy picture, you think, OK, low missing momentum, proton ne neutron pointing one way, then go to L equals 2. They have to point over the other way. An honest, realistic calculation does the same thing. Other effects are important, final state interaction, meson exchange currents. But in this particular example, the dominant effect, going from S only 
to adding the D state, that small 10%, as I get out to large missing momentum can be very important. Another way of thinking of that D state has to be, if I'm starting from a mean field, it's got to be something about nucleons working together, some kind of correlated system, even something as simple as a deuteron. Uh, the statistics here aren't so great, and I tried to find the BLAST plot because they have much better statistics. Uh, they see the same thing. I just couldn't find their data <laughs> online. So hopefully they'll get that published. They certainly have their neutron form factor out. So we saw this plot yesterday. This is from Claudio. Again, these are momentum distributions. And these aren't, if you want to do things properly, you absolutely need to use spectral function. Nevertheless, this is a nice way to think about the problem. These are momentum distributions of various nuclei, starting from the deuteron, helium-3, carbon iron. And at low missing momentum, you get the textbook result. OK, I got nucleons in a nucleus. I add more. I'm changing the size of the box. I'm changing the shape of uh, momentum distribution. What's interesting in this figure this is from Claudio and Simula, the functional form of all these distributions as I go out to very high initial momentums. And of course, that's something a theorist can calculate. I can't observe directly the initial. But the functional form gets to be the same. Now, for those of you who like writing Monte Carlo codes, you'll immediately realize, hey, this is fantastic. I have a region where the functional form of something is the same as something I can actually calculate or get from my theoretical friends, the deuteron. So at the very least, I could take my deuteron functional form. If I knew n, which would just be the factor of the scaling between these various functions, I could actually get the high momentum part for any nucleus. And that's kind of fun to play with. But how could I even think about trying to access this? And this is what was referred to. Engo is you know, where Jefferson Lab's gone off on the E prime high x. There was a motivation, and it's one from kinematics. If you imagine you're in kinematics where the dominant effect is knocking a single nucleon out of the nucleus, you can ask yourself, how the heck did I get to this x greater than 1 kinematics anyway? There is no x greater than 1 kinematics for a free nucleon. Effectively, if what is truly going on is you're hitting something in the initial state, you're in basically a collider kinematics. Your electron's getting more energy than it could have if it was hitting something that was stationary. And you can just calculate, regardless of whether or not it's correct, but you can go ahead and do it as a thought experiment. What if that's true? And you get th these curves for various q squareds. So starting from very low q squared, moving up as a function of your k and x. This is just saying, kinematically, and with the onsatz and hitting something that's moving, I not only can explain how it's possible to be at x greater than 1, I actually can predict where in the Bure k and x variable I'd expect to see the scaling. So this is theory, prediction that these functional forms would be the same. This is just using a kinematic argument to say, OK, you go to a q squared of 10, you should start to see that scaling around a Burkean x of 1.2. So if I took a ratio of a ee prime divided by deuterium ee prime, I expect to see the functional forms be the same at that x. As you get to very low q squared, you won't see anything. You don't have the kinematic reach just in phase space to ever see such high momentum and inclusive. And this is sometimes referred to as minimum missing momentum. And so it's just an idea. There's certainly other things possible. But it's as if you're doing E prime P reaction, even though you're doing E E prime, if the onsatz is correct. This is what was seen. So people did do inclusive scattering, originally done at Slack by Frankfurt. And what they observed, what you're looking at here, so this is helium-4 divided by helium-3. They've taken the ratio of the inclusive cross-sections. They've also taken into account the counting of the nucleons in the nucleus. And what they observed as they plot, plotted their data versus Bjorkane X is a region with a shape. That's natural if you assume the size of the nucleus is different between the two. And a region that was flat. 
that has been attributed both to final state interactions or initial state, other different interpretations. What is beautiful from a phenomenological point of view of the result is it's been shown to be rather Q squared independent. So if I take helium-3 over helium-4 at Q squared of 5, Q squared of 10, this 2 keeps coming out of the data. So phenomenologically, it's almost beautiful. I can always get that same number. So if I wanted to test a model, at least see if it was sane at high Q squared and at high X, it should be able to reproduce that number. It'd be a, a test. Um, this has been repeated many times now in the halls at Jefferson Lab. So hall B repeated it first. Hall C took even more data. For hall C, I don't show it, but they also get the absolute cross-sections of all their targets. So here you're looking at the ratios of the nucleus shown to deuterium instead of helium-3 plateaus. As you get to the very heavy nuclei, life is getting very complicated in the, this plateau, or at least this the functional form between the various nuclei being the same is not so readily apparent. Nevertheless, for the light nuclei, rather clear. Lots of data. There's new data coming from Hall A. They see the same thing. And you see it at the same height, uh, regardless of the Q squared. There's just some of the Q squares that were taken between Hall A and Hall C. One thing I will note, uh, there were results uh, several years ago at this point from Hall B that uh, claimed a second plateau for X greater than 2. Neither of the high luminosity Hall C such a plateau, and that data is being looked into. In particular, bin migration effects are a little bit worrisome with class with its enormous uh, acceptance. So I suspect truth will end up being the plot you see here. No, it's not shown on this plot. The class data almost looks like a mirror of this plateau, but a little bit higher. came in right here. I mean, it's a, a detail, right? So as you get up to very high x, what are you doing to omega? Omega is getting very small. What happens if you have a detector with a finite resolution? You start smearing in omega, so it's very easy to feed or have bin migration from a lower x to a higher x. And my <laughs> personal guess, uh, and it's being checked, is that they did not carefully look at that kind of bin migration, didn't average over. They didn't put in the Monte Carlo a real cross-section, average it over the whole acceptance of class. That's When you have four pi detectors, you guys all know that gets challenging. We have small acceptance spectrometers. It's easy. In fact, we do it all the time. It's just very natural. So this is kind of the state of these inclusive measurements. So as I said before, the interpretation of that plateau it certainly causes much uh, discussion and interesting conversation in the hallway. What's pretty is we always see it. I don't care what Q square we dial in, we keep seeing it. It's there. So it is a physical phenomena. It's a nice one we can measure. And models should easily be able to predict that. Uh, just some comments about final state interactions. Yes, you, you definitely need final state interactions. Your car needs wheels. We, we talk about these various ingredients as if I can take them off, put them on. I need them all. I need the correlations. I need the final state interaction. I need the mesonic exchange currents. Now, which ingredient is most important in any given kinematics can certainly change. But you at very least need to make sure you have the right ones. Um, there were comments earlier today about testing to make sure you have the right ones. You don't necessarily need them all, but I need to make sure for the kinematics that are relevant, I have the right ones and I'm doing it in a consistent way. And I think the consistency is really one of the most important bits. So whichever model you're choosing, you can't just grab randomly uh, various prescriptions. You really need to make sure everything has been normalized in the same way. So now I'd like to show some of those abysmal kinematics uh, that were done. And to show that even though I may have a reaction mechanism effect that's dominant, uh, you still can learn a lot. And it's amazing the agreement that theory is able to get uh, with the data, even in places that aren't ideal. Uh, an experiment that was proposed in the late 80s. And in hindsight, this was not the kinematics uh, they wanted to be in. Uh, Hall C, with the data you saw, saw yesterday from Ingo and Daniela, very pretty in the parallel kinematics. 
was where you had Q and the initial proton in the same direction. Here they're in what we refer to as perpendicular kinematics, not even truly perpendicular. They fixed the, the Q and the omega of the experiment, they fixed the electron arm. And we're scanning the proton arm. What you're looking at on this slide is slices in missing momentum and across the bottom, missing energy. And you see this nice little peak going along. This is something that's been observed at Saclay and many, many labs. If I just look at the E prime P cross section out in the continuum, you'll see a ridge or a peak. This is what's in that spectral function we saw yesterday. When you look at energy versus momentum and you see a ridge, it follows this, this shape. It's often referred to as a quasi-deuteron ridge moving in the nucleus. For if you just take the kinematics of a deuteron, you'll predict where that ridge should be. And that's what this little red arrow is. It's just taking a quasi-deuteron picture and calculating where I would expect to be for that momentum in energy. This kinematics is completely dominated by final state interactions. What you would expect if I was looking at a spectral function, per se, or really initial state, is way down. In many orders of magnitude up is what was measured in this particular experiment. What's pretty and easier to see on the second panel, if I take these slices and I integrate out over missing energy, I can make an effective density or effective momentum distributions. So it allows me to plot in one dimension instead of two. This is a convenience. If I want to do things properly, go back to the spectral function. Uh, what this has allowed me to do is put the two-body breakup. So helium-3 E prime P goes to a deuteron. This is the momentum distribution. And helium-3 E prime P, Pn, on the exact same plot, that's the upper curve. This cross-section on high missing momentum is completely dominated by the continuum. It's also completely dominated by final state interaction effects. But what's fun, even though this is where you would get if you went into good parallel kinematics, this is what I got in this fairly odd kinematics in hindsight. If you take all the ingredients, put them in together, the models can do a rather good job of describing the data, getting all the ingredients together. And really what's happened over the years with electron scattering is we have many of these kinematics. So some of the kinematics were more focused or did a better job of isolating one parameter or another. Today, when you start putting them all together, here he's able to do a rather nice job describing the data, even in places that in hindsight weren't particularly good. And this is probably one of the more horrible examples. This is deuterium E prime Pn at low x. So if you go think back to that plot of Kinematics I showed you, even for a free proton, I get down to low x. I start having to worry about pions, delta components, everything else. This is class data. And what you're seeing here as I'm going out, and this would be the same as missing momentum, momentum of the neutron in the deuteron. This data has little to nothing to do with the initial state. I could vary the potential here wildly. Not much happens. It's all about the reaction mechanisms. And by putting in final state interactions, meson exchange currents, and to delta transitions, you actually do a reasonably good job of describing the data. Do you have these twice? They're both being high. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> reasonably good job, I would say. Yeah, how does that make Yeah, yeah, no, and you, when you have this many in ingredients and you're in a place where you I'm out to 2 GeV of missing momentum. I find it striking that able to do even that uh, well. Is it good enough? No. <laughs> right? At some level, you would say another level. This is a tiny bit of the absolute cross section. So I find it remarkable you're able to do even this well. And again, it depends what you're trying to isolate and what you're trying to learn. I just want to show some counterexamples of where you went to the wrong kinematics and what we saw wrong compared to trying to isolate a spectral function, for example, if you can even find those kinematics. Just to show you where things have come to, this is one calculation, may or may not be correct, calculation, this is from MESOC, and hopefully this plot has motivated Wally to make a similar plot with what hopefully is a better calculation. But 
Misak has used the AV18 nuclear nuclear potential to get a momentum distribution. He uses Glauber. He did a calculation x squared than one kinematics and took a ratio of his cross section where he's included final state interactions and divided that by plane wave impulse approximation. And this mess you're looking at is the angle between the Q vector and the recoiling neutron. And so naively, you'd go parallel and perpendicular, so 0 and 90. When you do this full type of calculation for this Q squared, it's a little shifted. But you can see this huge, completely dominant, you know, very large Q squared of final state reactions. These curves are for different missing momentums, or momentums of the neutron from the E prime P reaction. It gets huge. On the other hand, there are places where, at least in the context of this picture, the final state interactions get small. So ideally, you'd measure over a range of angles between the neutron and Q, and so that you get this. And there have been experiments, particularly in class, where they've done that. And you do reproduce similar shapes for slices in missing momentum, showing that you're starting to get a handle, a very nice handle, on reaction mechanisms. You can make a prediction, and we can observe similar thing. So an experiment that's upcoming, uh, this is a comparison with one theory, to do the deuterium, just deuterium, not even up to carbon, you guys want argon. Deuterium, <laughs> E prime Pn, uh, they've chosen x greater than one kinematics, very large Q squared, uh, based on the input uh, from theorists. This is a place to go, to go out to very high missing momentum, and with a full calculation, where they folded in different nucleon, nucleon potentials, they have a sensitivity to the potential. So the, the red is where the AV18 is where the projected data lies. You can tell we have a, a bias already. But uh, this is an experiment that will go out to a missing momentum of a GeV and, and kinematics that we believe are relatively well under control to actually try to learn more about that. Measure the cross.